Open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Matthew at chapter 16. Matthew at chapter number 16, verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Thank you. You may be seated. grass withers and the flower thereof fades away but the word of our God shall stand forever I want to talk about the resurrected life the resurrected life what what does it mean to be a Christian The answer is as varied as the many persons that you ask. For some, to be a Christian means church membership. For others, it is baptism or confirmation. Still others believe that being moral or religious is enough to wear the moniker Christian. I want to argue this morning that the answer is in the question. The word Christian literally means the Christ ones. It was first given to followers of Jesus in Acts chapter 11 at verse number 26, in a place called Antioch. Historically, the name Christian was a term of derision. It was a term of contempt because pagans were offended by the lifestyles and the preaching of the believers and gave them the name Christian as an insult. Sadly, to be Christian today is socially acceptable and expedient because it is classified as a religious sect no more or no less than to be a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness or a Buddhist or a Muslim or a black Israelite Because people are being told falsely that all roads lead to God. You can't get to the God of the Bible through the Mormons, through the Jehovah's Witnesses, through being a Buddhist, through following the black Israelites. The only way to get to God is through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus did not say, I am one of the ways. I wish I had a witness. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. Uh, I'm sorry, Oprah. There are not a thousand ways to get to God. 150 years ago, a man by the name of Lewis Carroll wrote a book that perhaps many of us have read called Alice in Wonderland. Alice falls into Wonderland, which is metaphorical for looking for philosophical knowledge 
uh, Alice falls in Wonderland and she runs upon several characters, a rabbit and a, this person and that person. And since she happens upon a Cheshire cat and Alice in Wonderland, Alice asks this cat for directions. And the cat says, where are you trying to go? Alice says, I don't really know. And the cat says, well, any road will take you there. Somebody going to get that on the way to Papa Do. If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. But if you're on the way to meet Jesus Christ, to know God the Father, he says there's a broad road and there's a narrow road. And on the broad road, there's many travelers, but on the narrow road, there's a traveler every now and then. Because broad is the way, but it leads to destruction. Narrow is the way, but it leads to life eternal. Joining a church or being a good person or just claiming the name for yourself or for your organization does not make you a Christian. I've said to us before, if you can be a Christian sitting in this church, you can be a car sitting in your garage. You are not a Christian because, you, I, I, I hear people say this often and, 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 and it bothers me and I don't want to get into a deep conversation with them unless I have to. Uh, people say, I don't go to church, but I'm a good person. There's none good. No, not a one. I wish I had somebody to help me preach. You think good people come to church? We come to church because we are no good. We come to church because we need to be forgiven of our sins. We come to church because we messed up just last week. But grace, I wish I had a witness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness because he knows we're going to mess up again. No, the church is not the place for good people. The church is the place for forgiven people. Uh, to be a Christian means to be like Christ. Beginning in verse 21 of chapter 16, Jesus is talking to his disciples about his impending death on the cross. Peter rebukes him in verse 22. And Jesus tells him, get behind me, Satan. And Jesus uses this occasion as an opportunity to teach them about the real heart of Christianity. Let me just give you an aside here. Have you ever wondered why God the Father chose not to erase Calvary's scars from Jesus' resurrected body? God's power had overcome all the violence of Monday, Thursday and Good Friday. Why not remove the reminders of his suffering and his agony on the Via Dolorosa and the cross? Why must the wounded Messiah, the crucified king, carry his scars into eternity? I submit, brothers and sisters, that the scars of Jesus is an invitation to a crucifixion. And the crucifixion is our own. He invites us to come die. 
let me let me let me let me let me slow down here. Because we Christian readers of the gospel today have become so accustomed to the cross as a word or a symbol that it is hard now to recapture the shudder that the word cross must have brought to the hearers in Galilee at the time Jesus spoke that word. Popular usage has sanitized the language of having a cross to bear so that its challenge has evaporated. Although we may not face a lethal execution for being a loyal disciple, those of us who are serious about our faith know that there will be social stigma attached to carrying your cross behind Jesus. If you love Christ, you won't get invited to all the stuff. If you love Jesus, people who used to walk with you won't walk with you anymore. If you are really serious about your commitment to Christ, there are some people in your life you're going to have to unfriend. We would do well to remember the immortal words of Jim Elliot, who gave his life in martyrdom as a missionary to the natives of Ecuador. Jim Elliot says, he is no fool who forsakes what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Until kingdom reality outweighs every consideration, even your own life, you are not a true follower of Jesus Christ. Now the disciples of Jesus lived out indeed what was written centuries later by one who himself was martyred for his faith in Nazi Germany a preacher by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who wrote in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, that when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. The disciples, way ahead of Bonhoeffer, if I call him up this morning, they would testify that following Jesus cost them their lives. Peter was crucified upside down because he did not think himself worthy to be crucified like Jesus right side up. Andrew was crucified in the form of an X. Thomas, doubting Thomas, who became a believer after he touched the print of the nails in his hands and in his side, Thomas was pierced through with spears by four soldiers at the same time. Bartholomew was skinned alive. Matthew, who wrote the gospel, was speared to death. Mark, who wrote his gospel, was dragged to death. Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, was hanged on an olive tree. Matthias was burned alive. Paul was beheaded at Nero's chopping block. The only apostle to survive and live a long life was banished to an isle called Patmos, and that disciple was John, who was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And he said, I heard him write, these words are true and faith. I wish I had two or three Bible readers. John heard the resurrected Christ that he had seen in the flesh. Now he sees in heaven, says, right, that I'm Alpha and Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the first and the last. I'm he that liveth and was dead, but behold, I'm alive forevermore. If any man 
will come after me. Let him deny himself. Take up a cross and follow me. Now, now, now the first two verbs in this verse, deny and take up, are in the aorist tense of momentary action. In, in a moment, you can deny yourself. In a moment, you can take up your cross. That's in the aorist tense. But, but the third verb, follow me, is in the present tense of continuous action. You can take up your cross, you can deny yourself, but you got to keep following. Uh, clearly, brothers and sisters, the impetus is on this matter of individual decision. Your mother can't believe for you. Your father can't believe for you. You can't have enough faith for your children. Your children have got to find God for themselves. You can pray for them, but you can't save them. You've got to get out of the way and let God save them. Yeah. Let me see if I can help us. If any man, that means woman, boy, or girl, if anybody wants to follow me, Jesus said, you must first deny yourself. So first of all, we must lay something down. That's conversion. You have to lay something down. To follow as God demands, to follow as God demands is to renounce the centrality of the self. Self-denial is to disassociate one's self from one's own interests, which in this case means the willingness to risk one's life. It means putting loyalty to Christ before self-preservation. Romans at chapter 6 and verse number 11 reads, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Galatians at chapter 2 and verse number 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet, not I but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The reason, brothers and sisters, this sounds so hard is because it is. If being a Christian was easy, everybody would be doing it. But since it's hard, it takes people who are willing to lay something down. You, you've got to lay down your image of yourself. You've got to get off Facebook and put your face in this book. Because the danger of social media, as useful as it is, I praise the Lord for, for the internet and for Facebook and I thank God for YouTube and those mediums that we are able to use to get the gospel forth and people are able to communicate with each other and take care uh, uh, of each other through Facebook and through uh, social media. That's a wonderful tool, but it's demonic in the wrong hand. And by demonic, I mean you are so concerned about your social image that you have no social contacts. You are so busy branding yourself that you have no interest outside yourself. 
you spend all day cropping pictures of yourself. Making yourself look like you don't really look. And then you sit by your phone and every minute you look to see if you got a like. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Well, let me encourage you this morning. Like yourself. Take yourself to lunch. Take yourself to the movies. I wish I had two or three witnesses here. Stop waiting on people to affirm you and to prop you up and to make you feel like somebody. You are somebody if you are a child of God. If anybody asks you who I am, I wish I had some noise here. Tell them. I'm a child of God. I don't care who likes me, who does not like me, who's on my side, who's not. If God be for us, I wish I had a witness. Who can be against us? Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Don't be envious against the workers of iniquity. They shall soon be cut off like grass. And God will make them wither like the green herb. He'll prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. And anoint your head with oil that your cup. Somebody's cup this morning is just running over. Because surely goodness and mercy is following you. You didn't go to college, but look at where you are. You don't have a master's degree, but look what God has done for you. You don't live in a gated community, but you sleep at night. If it had not been, I wish I had some help here. If it had not been for the Lord who was on my side. Yeah. Listen. When you lay down interest in yourself, It's hard for people to hurt your feelings. Because I've been crucified with Christ. Somebody ought to help me preach here. It's hard for folk to put you down when you've already laid yourself down. Because how are you going to kill somebody who's already dead? You think you lying on me going to stop God from blessing me? You think you hating on me going to stop God from raising me up? God will let you be my footstool. He'll put a table before me and all you can do is watch me eat. I ain't scared of you. My father is rich. In houses and land. He holds the might of the world in his hand. The earth is the Lord. I wish I had a Bible reader. And the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwells therein. He's founded it upon the sea. And established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in the holy place, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who is not lifted up his soul under vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your head. Somebody ought to help me right here. O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, 
and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this? Hey, who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in the battle. Lift up your head. O ye gates, and be lifted up ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. You, you remember when, when Joshua and the children of Israel were in the promised land and they were getting ready to, to handle Jericho and Joshua went out on reconnaissance to check it out and, and, and the angel of the Lord a pre-incarnate visitation of Jesus showed up right next to Joshua and Joshua said are you for us or are you for our adversary? And the captain of the Lord's host said, I'm not for you nor am I for your adversary because when the Lord shows up, he does not show up to take sides, he shows up to take over. And if you can't handle it in your life this morning, move out of the way and let God take over. He'll fight your battles if you let him take over. We must, we must, we must lay something down. That's conversion. But not only ought you to lay something down, we must lift something up. To lay something down is conversion but to lift something up is commitment if any man will come after me he must deny himself that's that's laying something down but then you got to take up a cross that's lifting something up when Jesus said that we are to take up our cross he is saying that we are to live as dead men and women. To take up your cross means to embrace the death of the self. To clarify what taking up a cross means, it may be helpful here for me to define what cross-bearing is not. In, in, in the Syrian Orthodox Church, they, they have a doctrine, they have a theology that's called we are negativa, which is a negative reasoning about God. It's getting at God by talking about what he's not. Uh, you, you can say that God is not good. God is not gracious. That, that's about the end of what you can say that God is not. I can be here till in the morning talking about what God is. So, if you would get a good understanding this morning of what cross-bearing is, I need to try to share with us what cross-bearing is not. It is not a divorce. I'm, I'm, I'm going to preach this in a, in, in a couple of Sundays. Uh, I'm, I'm working on it right now. I got a little word I'm working on about right there. Uh, and, and the word is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, I'm just giving you a preview. Uh, my sermon is entitled, Being Single is Not a Disease, and Being Married is Not a Cure. I, I, I think I'm going to preach that the third Sunday of, of, of next month. That, that's not a cross. When, when you get a divorce, sometimes that's a deliverance. Yeah. 
You shouldn't have been with that fool in the first place. A cross is not the death of a spouse. As painful as that is, that's not bearing a cross. A wayward, crazy child is not a cross. If you got two children, one of them is going to be a fool. And if you got one, they're going to be half crazy. Ask me, I know. But Victoria is not my cross. A cross is not your mother-in-law. It's not your son-in-law. It is not a difficult supervisor at the job or a challenging circumstance in your life. To take up one's cross is not just to suffer and die, it means to bear shame. Now, now, first century readers would have known immediately what Jesus was talking about when he said take up a cross because to take, a, take up a cross meant you were on your way up a hill. You were on your way to an execution. You were on your way to be de delivered unto death. And not only did you have to die on the cross, but before you got there, you had to carry your own cross. And you didn't carry it at night. You carried it in the middle of the day. And then you were crucified naked to, to humiliate you. To shame you. That's why Deuteronomy says, Cursed is he that hangs on a tree. Yes, to die on a cross, your name was blotted out of the family legacy. Your family was run out of town or run out of the village because bearing a cross and dying on it was a shame. Now, brothers and sisters, hear me. It means you were willing to identify with Jesus' death, with his word, regardless of what it cost you. I'm trying to hurry with this little sermon. But um, nobody wants to talk about the dirty side of Christianity. Let me tell you what I mean by that. We live here in, in, in South Texas. And we know something in the southern part of the country about hurricanes. We, we, we are soon to come upon hurricane season. And, and they, there's hurricane preparedness kits and, and uh, there's always announcements about hurricanes. You can get out of the way of, of a hurricane. I would not like to live where there's an earthquake where you don't know when it's coming. You're just, everything falling on the floor. But, but you can prepare for a hurricane. But even in all the preparation you do for a hurricane's coming, there is what is called the dirty side of the hurricane. And the dirty side of the hurricane is where the most intense weather patterns are. It's the most dangerous side of the hurricane. And the meteorologists warn people to stay away from the dirty side of the hurricane. Well, nobody wants to talk about the dirty side of Christianity. The only Christianity we want to hear about is name it and claim it. Uh, live your best life now. We, we want to hear about a Christianity where, where everybody likes you and, and you just have to think positive thoughts. And if you think big thoughts, God will give you big things. And if you are always positive, life will always work out your way. That's cute. That's so sweet. That's syrupy. That's honey glazed. But it's a lie. 
Because the dirty side of Christianity means that you may have to take care of a sick loved one a long time. The dirty side of Christianity means you might lose your job doing your best. The dirty side of Christianity may mean that the folk who sat with you last Sunday don't want to sit with you this Sunday for no reason at all. The dirty side of Christianity is that the folk down the street who don't ever go to church, everything is going well in their lives, and there's mess going on in your life, almost said a bad word. There's stuff going on in your life right now because you give God your best, you pray, you go to church, you pay your tithe, you read the Bible, and you still get breast cancer. That's the dirty side of Christianity. Somebody ought to help me preach here. But if you stay there, on the dirty side of Christianity long enough you will hear an announcement that the pilot makes when the weather gets turbulent. If you've been in turbulent weather on a plane the pilot says fasten your seat belts. Put your seat trays back in their full upright and locked position. Put your carry-on luggage in the overhead rack. We are experiencing some unexpected turbulence. We're going to be out of it in a minute. But for the moment, fasten your seat belts. Put your seat trays back in their full upright lock position. Put your carry-on luggage in the overhead rack. Somebody in here this morning might be on the dirty side of Christianity. Fasten your seat belts. Put your seat trays back in their full upright lock position. Put your carry-on luggage in the overhead rack. Don't come up here and try to fly the plane. You don't have any flight experience. Don't be trying to tell the stewardess or the pilot what to do. They've been through some bad weather before. Just fasten your seat belts. I wish I had somebody to help me close here. Put your, put your luggage in the overhead rack. You're going to be out of it in a minute. God has a strange way of navigating us through difficult circumstances. If any man would come after me, he must deny himself and then take up his cross. You got to lay something down. You have to lift something up. But then finally, you got to live something out. You got to go everywhere telling everybody you meet that I know a man from Galilee. You've got to live it not just on Sunday, but you've got to live it on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, Saturday, and then come back here on Sunday and hear the gospel one more time and then go back to your jobs go back to your family and tell the devil shoot your best shot if you don't kill me now if you don't destroy me now devil you might have your last chance to tear up my testimony you might have your last day to make me cry devil you better hit me while you can you better pull me down while you can because if I get to that church on Sunday morning and be around my brothers and my sisters, if I get on my pew Sunday morning, if I get a chance to open my Bible and hear my pastor talk about Jesus, you might have had your last chance. Because if I get to Lily Grove and hear my preacher talk about Jesus, I know what he's going to say this Sunday. Because he said the same thing last Sunday. He died. Didn't he die? But early Sunday morning, he arose. Didn't he rise? Is there anybody here trying to live your life following Jesus Christ? You're going to be lied on sometimes. You're going to be criticized sometimes. You're going to be talked about behind your back. People who you thought were with you. Wait till you get in trouble. And the folk you thought were on your side. 
you'll find out who your real friends are. That's why you ought to help me this morning. Say, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Won't he bring you out? Won't he open the door? Won't he make a way out of no way? If God's been good to you and you're not embarrassed to testify, if God has made a way for you and you don't care who's looking at you, if God has saved you and you're glad to be in the service one more time, why don't you look at somebody, tell them I'm saved, sanctified, filled with his precious Holy Ghost. I got Jesus. I've got Jesus. I know he's all right. He walks with me. He talks with me. He told me I am his own. Why don't you look at somebody? Give them this benediction. Help them with this benediction. Now under him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless. Faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding great joy. Now under him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you can even ask. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he fix it? I know he's alright. Oh, oh, have to lay something down you have to lift something up but the Holy Ghost will help you to live something out I'm living this life so I can live again there's a place that the righteous can call home Somewhere where the wicked will cease from trouble and the weary can be at rest. Some glad morning when this life is over, when I'm, when I'm through down here, I will fly away. No more sickness. No more suffering. No more sorrow, no more pain, no more death. Because the former things are passed away. Paul said, now we see through a glass darkly. But then face to face, I will know even as I am also known. Behold, what manner of love is this? That we would be called sons of God. And it doth not yet appear 
what we shall be. But we know that when he comes, we shall be like him, or we shall see him as he is. Eyes have not seen. Ears have not heard. Nor has it entered the hearts of men the good things that God has in store for them that love him. Our brothers are standing now. And maybe there's somebody here. Maybe there's somebody here this morning who has not yet trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Or maybe you know Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, but you're looking for a church where you can come and live out your faith. You, you have to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Won't you do it today? Some glad morning when God bless you. I'll see you coming. Fly away. To a home on God's celestial shore. Come on, baby, that's right. Somebody else is here this morning. God bless you. Oh, I fly away. Come on, man, that's right. Do it now. Oh, Lord, fly away. I die, hallelujah, by and by. I Just a few more weary days and then. Weary days and then. I fly away to a home. Shall never end. Oh, fly away. Oh, fly away. Oh, when I die. Hallelujah. Bye. When the shadows of this life are gone, when the shadows of like a bird from prison bars have flown, like a bird from prison bars have flown. for us softly. Soon I will be done with the troubles of this world. Paul said, we know. We, we, ain't, we, ain't, we ain't guessing about this. We know that if this earthly house of this tabernacle is dissolved, we have another building. A house not made with hands. I know that there's a place called heaven. And I've decided to make heaven my home. My mother is there. My father is there. My brothers are there. My grandmother is there. But all of them have got to wait because soon as my feet strike Zion, I'm going to lay down my heavy burden and I want to see Jesus 
and tell him thank you for all you've done for me. Thank you for heavenly vision. Thank you. You met me at the gates of hell. Thank you that you cut loose my stammering tongue and took my feet out of the miry clay. I'm going home to be with God. But I've got to lay down something. I've got to pick up something. Then I've got to live something out. You don't just serve God till you get old. You serve till you die. You don't serve till you get tired. You serve till you die. The race is not to the swift. The battle is not to the strong. But to whomever can hold out to the end. Jeremiah says, if you've run with the footmen and they've wearied you, how shall you contend with horses? If you can't make it in the land where peace and prosperity abide, how are you going to make it at the swelling of the joy? The book of Proverbs says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. But if you lay something down, and lift something up he'll help you to live something out oh I fly away glory oh when I die hallelujah Just a few more weary days and then. To a home where joy shall never end. has been extended to you and always it is your always it is yours either to receive or to reject let's give God the glory for these who have joined our church today